sing this holy ground madly together. Stand with me. We're going to sing these two hymns. They face each other in our hymn on 71 and 72. You can watch those and screens if you like. Here we go. Let's sing together and worship together.
I challenge you to read that chapters three and four. You know, when they healed the lame man at the beautiful gate, uh, and then and then uh, Peter just lets him have it, and he said, you know, it was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one you crucified. That is the only name given under heaven by which men may be saved. So let me just ask you, what's the name? Jesus. Amen. We may move on. I am going to let you be seated, all right? So the next hymn, Brother Troy's going to give us that. So in one word, can you describe God's faithfulness? Amen. Hymn number 96. Six. Ninety-six. Let's sing it together. Bring your thy faithfulness.
Amen? Amen. So last week we did not get a chance to sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, but I was looking up hymns that deal with faith, because I know the word faith is in our message this morning, and uh, as I begin to look, every time and everywhere I looked, this hymn that we did not get to sing last week came up in every search. So 446, I will allow you to keep your seats but sing with me this Baby Crosby song, Blessed Assurance.
thank you so much, Brother Randall. And let me say that I did fail to mention in our announcement that there will be a groundbreaking ceremony Thursday, 10 o'clock in the morning. And everyone who would like is encouraged to be here. All right, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me now, if you will, to the New Testament, to the little book of Jude, one chapter. And we'll begin reading with verse 1. Jude, beginning with verse 1, and I want to share a message with you this morning entitled, A Description of the Faith. Stand with me now in reverence to God's Word. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. Them that are sanctified, the word means loved by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You may be seated. I pray that the Lord would teach us this morning. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful opportunity, this hour together, together as your people. And Father, I ask that you would bless this time in your work. And that, as Brother Randall sang, that Lord, you would speak to each one of our hearts today. Lord, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Some time ago, I was talking with a group of men, a group of pastors, and we became involved in a discussion over the day and age in which we find ourselves living. And one of the, the older men in the group made the statement that most of the people in his day uh, grew up living relatively sheltered lives. He said, you know, we, we knew that there there were evil things going on around us, uh, but we were far off from it. It was in places like New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago. And again, he, he, he said, we knew, we knew there were problems, uh, but they were always a long way off. And you know, I grew up in, in that same era. Uh, we, we really did, if you think about it, those of you my age, we really did live sheltered lives back then. Uh, but you know, it's not that way anymore. In, in, in the past several decades, we have been rudely awakened to the fact that sin is no longer somewhere way off. It's, it's, it's now in our own backyard. I mean, even small communities like, like Carlisle are in bad shape. But you know what? We really should not be surprised by this because 1900 years ago, the Apostle Paul predicted that this would take place, writing to his young minister friend in the faith by the name of Timothy. He said, you need to understand that in the last days, perilous times are going to come. And then he, he went on to list a number of the things that would characterize this time. He said men will become lovers of self, lovers of money, disobedient to, to parents without natural affection, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, and, and so on. And you know, you can't read that passage of scripture without realizing what an incredibly accurate description that is of the day and age in which we're living now, I mean, it describes almost perfectly the way that things are today. But Paul also warned Timothy of something else that would take place during the last days. In 1 Timothy 4.1, he said, But the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the last days some shall depart from the faith. And this departing, this, this falling away is what is known in the Word of God as apostasy. And so this is also something that is indicative of the day and age in which we live because today, perhaps more than any other time in the history of the church, uh, we see uh, people who, who are leaving, I mean, and leaving the truth, entire uh, denominations who are leaving the truth 
of God's Word. In fact, I, I think that the greatest threat uh, that perhaps comes to the church today, it comes from these people that, that Paul was talking about, those who are apostate, those who claim to believe in, in the Word of God but deny the, the inspiration and the authority of, of His Scripture. Listen, you know, we, we need as, as a people to be aware that this is going on. I mean, what I'm saying is we've been sheltered too long, folks. We need to wake up to what is happening right here, right now, in our own places. And so this morning, I want to begin a study in this little epistle. And because within these 25 verses of Scripture, Jude not only warns us uh, of these particular apostates, but he also describes the characteristic of them in such detail that by the time we finish this study, not only will we be able to recognize them, but we'll understand just how dangerous they really are. And let me just say that verse 3 of our text is, gives us a central theme of this entire book in that one little statement where Jude says, earnestly contend for the faith. And the word contend that he uses comes from a word in the Greek that means to engage in battle. It, it, it carries with it the idea of being involved in a warfare. So that what Jude was saying to these folks was, listen, there is a spiritual warfare that is going on all around you, and you must understand this warfare, and you must contend for the faith. And that's the central theme of the book, fighting for the faith. And so we, we need to understand it. And so again, I want to share a message with you this morning entitled, A Description of the Faith, because in these few verses before us, Jude gives to us one of the best descriptions of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be found anywhere in the Bible. And he uses three words to give us this description. And this is what I want us to look at in our time remaining. And the first word that he uses to describe the believer of Jesus is the word servant. Look at verse 1. He says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. The word is bond slave. One who is forever indebted to his master. <coughs> you know, I, 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 I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. This morning, I thought a lot about this. And had I been Jude, and had I been writing this epistle, I, I would have wanted everybody to know exactly who I was. Uh, I, I would have said, I am Mike Ledbetter, the half brother of Jesus Christ. And, and, and we can, you can think about it, but I'm sure most of us are the same way. Uh, you know what? We do that because we want people to be impressed. You know, Pam and I were talking a few days ago. I have been wearing hearing aids almost 20 years now. And, you know, I, I remember when I was first considering getting some, <clears throat> there was a, an ad in the Henderson Daily News about a hearing clinic that was going to be given. And, and that you could come and have your hearing tested. Well, you know, I, I knew I could hear. I, I mean, I've known that since I was a kid. Mine was due to, to nerve loss. But at any rate, I thought, well, it's free. I'm going to go. And so I did. I went and they, I had my hearing tested. And the lady said, you know, if, if you want to, you can come back a little later this afternoon. And I can go over the results of it with you. So I did. I came back. And she told me, she said, Mr. Ledbetter, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is, you have serious hearing loss. It's, it's a wonder you can hear anything that is being said to you. But she said, the good news is, we have now developed a hearing aid that will take care of the hearing loss problem that you have. And she pulled this box out and opened it, showed me those little hearing aids. They were tiny. They were fit in the canal of your ear. You could hardly even see them and she just went on and on and on about how great they were but as sort of a kicker she said now uh, this particular hearing aid was designed specifically for Ronald Reagan 
I perked up. I thought, shoot, I can have something in my ear that the President of the United States has in here. Of course, she knew that was what I was going to think. That was her whole point of telling me that she thought that I would be so impressed that Ronald Reagan wore the hearing aid that I was going to get that I would just up and buy a whole set without even considering the price. Well, let me just say, I, I didn't buy that hearing aid from her. In fact, it was years before I purchased some, but I, I'll, give her, I'll give her this. She was a great sales lady uh, because she, she understood human nature. She knew that people will do almost anything to impress others. And so I, I think that had I been Jew, really and truly, I would have said Jew, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. But Jew didn't do that. He described himself as a servant, a bond slave, one forever indebted to his master. Now, why did he do that? Let me tell you why. Because you realize the tremendous truth about salvation. And that is that it had nothing to do with his heritage. It had nothing to do with his background. It had nothing <clears throat> to do with anything he could have accomplished on his own. He understood that he was saved and had eternal life for one reason and one reason only, and that was because of the price that was paid on the cross of Calvary when Jesus died for his sin. And not only that, he also realized that because of what was accomplished there on the cross of Calvary, that he was no longer his own. He had been bought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus and therefore from that day forward his life belonged to his master and so uh, the first thing that you tells us that characterizes the life of the true believer it, it is not who he is but what he is and, and I think that maybe we need to slow down just a bit and, and go over this because until we understand what it means to be a servant of Jesus Christ We'll never be able to understand these other characteristics that he's going to be talking about. And let me just say that I, I, I think that probably one of the greatest uh, problems that is plaguing the church today is the fact that it is filled with so many people who are not servants of Jesus Christ. And those kind of people basically fall into two categories. The first category is made up of people who are members of a church but have never been truly saved. Which of course explains why they can't live the Christian life. Uh, because they're not Christian. And you know it doesn't matter how many times they may walk an aisle, how many times they rededicate their life, uh, it, it, it's not going to change anything. You, you can't rededicate something that's never been dedicated to begin with. And so the first group of people are those who are members but have never been saved. The second group is made up of those who know they're saved but have never truly sold out to the Lord. You see, Jesus is his only master when we give to him everything. But listen, you want to know why the majority of people today never make such a commitment? Because they think that if they do, they're not going to have anything left that God's going to take it all. But nothing could be further from the truth. The truth is until you make that store of commitment, the doors that lead to heaven's storehouse of blessings are never going to be open until you. You'll never get anything more out of the Christian life than what you have right now. And for a lot of Christians, that's not a whole lot. You know, it's amazing to me that they're really and truly, I think, very few Christians today who can honestly say that they're content. Very few who can really and truly say that they're happy and blessed by God. Again, the reason is because they're not committed. And until they're willing to make such a commitment, they can't truly call themselves servants of God. That's the first thing that you, the first word he used to describe the true believer. The second word that he uses is found at the end of the verse. Not only is a true believer someone who is a servant, but he or she is also someone who is called. Look again at what he says, you the servant of Jesus Christ, 
the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Called. Now, when Jude makes that statement, what is he saying? What does he mean to be called? Well, it's simply this. Whenever a person comes to Jesus, he does not come in his in his own on his own accord. He does not come on his own initiative. The only reason he comes is because the Lord has issued an invitation. Now, I, I know that a lot of people uh, have the idea that they think that it was their idea to make that decision and come to Jesus. But you know what? But scripture does not teach that. In John chapter 15, Jesus said to his disciples, you haven't chosen me. What? I've chosen you. And then in Acts chapter 2, Peter, preaching on the day of Pentecost, said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, the promise is to you and your children and to as many as are far off, as many as the Lord God shall call. And so that's the second thing he said. A Christian, a true believer, is someone who has been called by God and they've responded. And then the third and last word is the word preserved. One more time. You, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Preserved. What, what a wonderful word. It, it's a word in, in the Greek that means securely kept. And the idea is this, that Jesus will securely keep with an everlasting power every single person who has truly been called and responded. Jesus tells us this himself in John 10, 28. He says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You know what he says in the Greek? They shall never, no never, no never perish. See, what that's saying is that there is no greater security in all the world than that which God has given to those who have been called. And just to make sure we understand, Jude, at the end of the verse, he says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. And so we're twice secure. By Jesus, by God the Father, we're preserved. Now, what does all of this have to do with anything that, that Jude is talking about here in this <clears throat> epistle? Well, you see, we're living in a time, like I said earlier, when many are leaving the church. Many are going off into different kinds of religion, different cults. And, and so we have to wonder, Lord, if this, something like this could happen to them, how come, I, how come it can't happen to me? Well, Jesus said it could never happen to those who are truly called because he says... I'm preserving. And so mark it down. When, when people leave the true church and go off into a cult or whatever else, uh, it's nothing more than what uh, John said in his first epistle. They went out from us, but they were not of us because if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. Now, as we're going to see in the weeks ahead, uh, we're, we're living in very difficult and in very peril, perilous time. But Jude says, you have nothing to worry about. You have nothing to worry about. As a true servant of God, you have been called and you have been preserved. Therefore, you are as good for heaven as if you were already there. Now, let me ask you, in closing, does that apply to your life? I mean, can't you in your heart of hearts say this morning that you know that you've truly been saved? Church membership means nothing as far as salvation is concerned. Do you know that you have come to that point in your life when you admitted that you were a sinner, asked the Lord to forgive you and take over your life? If not, you're not a true servant of God, and you've never been saved. And so my prayer this morning is that you would allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you, to teach you, so that you might know. And if you cannot, in all honesty, say that you're saved, the invitation is for you. 
Now, the invitation is for anyone. There may be those who, who are looking for a church hall. We want you to come. There may be those who uh, need to just kneel at this altar and pray. But if you've never been saved, you come as we pray. Father, thank you. Lord, for this day that you have given us. Lord, thank you for this word that is so true. Father, just apply to our hearts. Holy Spirit, deal with each and every person here. And we'll be careful to praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. As we sing great hymn of invitation, I have decided to follow Jesus. And if the Lord would lead you to make, an in, uh, make a decision this morning, you come, even now as we sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. Anyone where you I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back.